shall come with a trumpet sound. said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for the crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. May the Lord add his blessing and understanding to the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Pastor Jeff Collins, it's good to be with you this morning. We live in a pluralistic age. That means that Whatever you believe is okay. If it works for you, then that's fine. It may not work for me, but if it works for you, that's fine. And all truth is relative. That's what our culture says. That's what our that's what our our, our age says. It doesn't matter what path you choose, it's it's all okay. We'll all go to the same place. We'll all be okay in the end. And uh, we should all just get along and be nice to each other and and uh, that's all okay, and whatever you believe is okay. Unless, of course, if you believe that there is only one way, and that all the other ways are wrong, then you don't fit in. Then it, it doesn't quite work for them. You see, toleration is our highest virtue in our culture. That, that you just let anyone <coughs> believe or do whatever they do, and and that one way works for everybody. 
But does one way work for everybody? Picture this. Suppose you come to a path in the woods, and on, uh, on that path, now you, you're about to pass through a high, dangerous mountain pass, okay? And you come to a place where the, where the paths diverge, and there's several signs there. And one sign says this way, and says this way is a safe way. But there's other signs there. You've got other options. One sign says bridge out. Yeah, if you go that way, you'll either come to the point where there's a bridge and you can't cross it and get stuck there, or you'll walk too far and go over the bridge and fall off. <laughs> Not a good option. Another one says uh, uh, no outlet. Probably a path that just circles round and round. You just circle round and round until you die. Probably not going to work well either. Uh, another one says dangerous cliff. Take that one, you fall off a cliff. I don't know if that's a great option either. Another one says bear habitat. You can go that way, but you're probably getting mauled and eaten. <laughs> There's somebody standing at the path, a hiker, and they say to you, you know, it really doesn't matter which path you take. They all, they all get safely across the mountain path. You can take whichever one you like. Which, whichever one looks, looks inviting to you, take it. And then there's another hiker that comes up and says, no, 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 don't, don't listen to that. that. Go the way that says this way. Go the way that says the safe way. You see, I'm from there, and I know that's the only way. Well, what should we believe? Who should we trust? Can we trust the signs? Can we trust the hiker? Can we trust the other hiker? Well, that's really our, our question this morning. Is there only one path? Can we trust Jesus when he says that there's only one path? Who can we trust? This morning we are continuing in our series on reforming the Reformation. Reformation, of course, that which happened 500 years ago to the year, 1517, uh, when Martin Luther posted 95 theses on the, on the uh, door of the Wittenberg Chapel and began a questioning of the practices that were happening in the church at that time. And uh, the questioning turned into a protest against those those very practices. Um, you remember they were selling indulgences, basically free tickets to heaven, and, and uh, it just didn't seem to fit with, with what was uh, in Scripture. And the only reason they knew what was in Scripture, because most of them didn't have the Scripture, and the Scripture was only available in Latin, and nobody could read it except the priests, and most of the priests couldn't get their whole hands on a book because books were pretty, pretty hard to get hold of. So most of them weren't familiar with that, but this Martin Luther who started questioning was, was, now he wasn't a Protestant, he was a Catholic. In fact, he was super Catholic. He was a monk, he was a priest, and he did all his penance, and he did all his confessions, and he, he tried everything he could to get right with God, and he just couldn't overcome his sense of, of guilt and his sense of worth, worthlessness before God. But then, as he was wearing out his confessors with three or four hours or sometimes six hours of confessions a day, his superiors finally sent him to the University of Wittenberg where he was uh, appointed as the chair of the uh, professor of, of biblical studies. So he got to read the Bible. And in the pages of the scriptures, he discovered that it wasn't by working his way in that he was saved. It was by faith alone. And, and he discovered here in the pages of Scripture that, that Scripture was our only authority. Sola Scriptura, <coughs> one of the five uh, solas, one of the five foundations that came out of, the, out of the Reformation. It's by Scripture alone that we can even know God, but it's by faith alone that we're saved. And so we have, we've talked about already two of the five solas of the Reformation. And today we're going to talk about the third Solus Christus, by Christ alone. By Christ alone. Is, is it Christ alone? Is he the only way? And, and can we trust that way? Well, let's talk about that. But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we come hungry and thirsty for everything that you have for us. For we know that your word is not just print on a page. And it's not just words in a book. It's not just histories or stories. It's living and active. 
And so we pray that you would visit us through your word, that you would make your character, your presence known to us and impress that upon our very being, that we might know you better. We do pray for the one who teaches that you would anoint him from on high and that you would direct everything that he does. Mm -hmm. That his people, that your people may be blessed. Lift up this time for you and pray that you be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Charles West, a friend of mine who's a pastor and missionary, sent me an email a couple of years ago about a pastor of Riverside Church in New York. Now, Riverside Church in New York is a very large church, probably one of the largest churches in our denomination, prominent church in our denomination in New York, right in Manhattan on Riverside Drive, uh, an impressive church. Uh, I think if I heard right, their, their pastor has a full-time chauffeur in limousine and makes about half a million dollars a year. Um, and so it's a prestigious pulpit. Dr. Brad Paxton was a uh, pastor of that church, uh, but he only lasted about a year. There were problems in the church of some 2,000 members. Um, those who opposed him said that he was doing things that just didn't fit in at Riverside. He was bringing in evangelical traditions and calling worshipers forward to bear witness to their faith. But that, if that wasn't enough, he was doing what what, what was considered a Riverside heresy. Here's the heresy. That Jesus, and only Jesus, was the way to salvation. Imagine that. Jesus has become a heresy in his own church. The opposer said Riverside has embraced a, and I quote, and embraced a broad spectrum interfaith style of Christian theology for all comers, whether Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, gay, lesbian, transgender, or none of the above. Doesn't matter, all the paths are good. See, they, they've bought into the culture and they've thrown out the scriptures, and they've thrown out the, everything that we learned in the Reformation, they've, they've gone right back to, to forgetting and, and taking on whatever the culture was, was going to give them. I listened to a, a sermon clip from uh, their new pastor, their current pastor, um, it was a wonderful message about freedom and loving each other and, and having hope. But there was no basis of hope. There was no gospel. There wasn't a single scripture in what she said. And there was, there was nothing of Jesus Christ. Well, after all, if she talks about Jesus Christ in that church, she'll get thrown out like Brad Paxton. Contrast that with what was read for us this morning. Peter and John were going up to the temple to pray one day, and as they went along, they encountered a man who had been crippled from birth. And he was begging. He was looking to them for money. And you remember the famous words of Peter, silver or gold, I don't have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And a man who was crippled from birth suddenly got up and walked, and he was walking and leaping and praising God, right? Like the song goes. And, and he, there was great joy, and people were, were astounded by what happened, and Peter and John were very quick to say, what you've seen was done by the power of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has raised this man to his feet, but more than that, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He who you put to death, and he's talking to the people who put him to death, he who you put to death is God in the flesh, and he has been raised from the dead. And he, they began to preach the gospel because the people were seeing the power of the gospel, and many were coming to believing. And you think that's a great thing, right? Except if you're a religious leader, because, you know, they were really responsible for putting Jesus on the cross, and they really didn't want this message getting out. They thought they'd put this all behind them. I mean, how much more could they do than put the man on the cross? How much more could they do than kill him? But now he rises from the dead. There's no getting rid of him. And so they arrest John and Peter. And uh, they bring them before the Sanhedrin, which you know is the highest court in the land. It's, it's the most powerful people among their people. They are opposed to Jesus. 
But Peter and John never back down. They never flinch. And even in the face of that opposition, they proclaim the message of the gospel, which they know to be true, because they've seen Jesus raised from the dead. They've seen him alive again. And there's no squelching that. There's no silencing that. There's no saying, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't fit or whatever. No. What do they say? There's salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Salvation is found in no one else but the name of Jesus Christ and Him only. Here they are before the, the highest court of the land. But they remain unflinching. Here they are before those who put their master to death. Knowing that their lives are also on the line here. But they don't care. Because they've seen the risen Christ and they know that no matter what these people might do to them, they have eternal life. They have no fear. We see that kind of boldness in Paul too, the apostle to the Gentiles, when he writes to the Galatians church and, 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 and wants to make sure that they keep focused on the gospel as they receive it, that it's Christ alone by whom we have been saved. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven. Paul says, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach. The good news which was preached is the good news which was true before. It was true in Paul's day. It is true today. It is true forever. It is unchanging. It is found in the words of Scripture. And, and we can rely upon it fully. Paul makes that, that bold statement. Did, did these guys make this up? Did these guys, uh, were, were they just arrogant? Did they think that there was some kind of advantage to this? Their lives testified to something different. There was no advantage other than the spread of the gospel. But even as the gospel spread, their lives were still on, on the line. The, the message of the gospel really brought them trouble. I mean, if you, if you just look at it from an objective point of view, almost all of them died for their faith. All of the, almost all of them died insisting that Christ had been raised from the dead and that he was the only way to salvation. And they didn't back down even in the face of tortures and death. Why would someone do that unless it was true? You know, they could have gotten along with the people of that day, especially you know, the Romans and the, and the pagans. I mean, after all, they had mints of gods. They had lots of gods for everything. And... They didn't mind that there were more gods. Yeah, that wasn't really a threat to them. What was a threat to them was when, when these believers are saying that Jesus Christ is the only God, the only way. They could have fit in real well with the pagans if they'd said, well, Jesus is another God. We can add him to the pantheon. Pagans were very pluralistic. They were very tolerant of, uh, you know, you, you can worship this God, and I'll worship this God, and all the gods, you know, it doesn't really matter which one we worship. Pagans are still very tolerant. Anyone who's tolerant of, of any way at all, but intolerant when we insist that it's the only way. But these believers in many since, in the centuries since, believed it was worth dying for and have done so through the ages. See, this gospel, this message of salvation, of the resurrection of Christ and the eternal life that we find in Christ, is not from men. It's from God. <clears throat> Galatians 1, verses 11 to 12. Dear brothers and sisters, I want you under to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I didn't make this stuff up, you say. I received my message from no human source, and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul didn't encounter Jesus Christ until after he'd been raised from the dead. Why did they all believe this? Why did they insist it? Because they saw Christ. And because Christ himself said that he was the only way, the only path. Solo, solus Christos. John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty exclusive. And pretty arrogant if you're not right, except for the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, and He is right, and He proved it 
when he was raised from the dead. Christ alone is our salvation. Solus Christus. That's been God's plan from the beginning. God always planned to come himself in the flesh and save us. Look with me at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 10 and 11. I'm reading from the New International Version on this one. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed. Nor will there be one after me. There are no other gods. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. How are we saved? By the only Savior, for there is only one Savior. I want you to look at this again for a minute. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. He's speaking to believers. You're my witnesses. And then some of the translations say, and my servant. You're my witnesses and my servant. But I don't think it's saying that. And in fact, the NIV, I think, reflects it well when it says, you are my witnesses. And there's another witness. And my servant, whom I've chosen. Now, who is that servant? That servant would be the suffering servant. Jesus Christ, who came to suffer and die for our sins. You are my witnesses. But my greatest witness will be Jesus. When I myself... Come as God in the flesh because Jesus was God with us. Emmanuel. He was the servant that is talked about. I, even I, am the Lord and apart from me there is no Savior. Christ alone is our Savior. In the time of the Reformation they lost sight of the fact that Christ alone is our salvation. They'd lost sight of it because they'd lost sight of the Bible. Most of them didn't know it. So whatever the priest said, I guess that's true, because the priest must know. And the priest often didn't know, but whatever the church said, they went with. And so, so things were, were getting out of hand. Things were getting twisted. The church believed that it wasn't just by Christ that you were saved, but by Christ and the church. The church which had to dispense the grace of God was the, the dispensary. Without the church, you couldn't come to Christ. So they made themselves a middleman, and they ended up getting in the way of Christ. You remember indulgences I mentioned before. Indulgences were your free ticket to heaven. You didn't have to suffer in any way. You didn't have to have any punishment. You didn't have to pay for your sins. But you could pay for this indulgence and get your sins forgiven. And what people did, because, you know, that's all they knew. They bought the indulgences. And they thought, well, I'm forgiven of my sins. I bought a plenary indulgence. That plenary meaning that it covers all my sins. So I don't have to worry about it. So I don't even think about sins. I live however I want. I covered the religious thing. I bought my indulgence. And so they didn't walk with Christ. They didn't, they didn't seek Christ. They didn't seek to know Him better. They, they sort of just did their own thing. They'd done their religious, they covered the religious thing, now they could do whatever they pleased. You ever see the same attitude today? My Catholic friends who, who worked hard to get their, their confirmation and their first Holy Communion, they did all the church stuff, they learned the catechism, and then that was it. They did their religious stuff, and they stopped going to church. Unless, you know, it's a special holiday and mom wants them to go or, or they're feeling especially guilty and they feel like they better go to confession and have the church cover it for them. But most of the time, they did whatever seemed good. And whatever seems good is usually whatever the culture is saying is good because, after all, we want to kind of get along with people. We all want to be, we all want to be nice. And so, so they've done their religious thing. And... And if they're not sure, even today, if they're not quite sure if they've covered it through what they did in the church saying the masses for them and, and, and confession, they can buy an indulgence. Even today can, can get an indulgence that will cover all their sins or even get them for their, for their dead relatives. This is still in the Catholic Catechism, the current Catholic Catechism. All you need to do is, is, is Google it, all right, and it'll come up with the Catholic Catechism, Chapter 2, Article 10, is, is indulgences. And this is what it says about indulgences. This is from the Catholic Catechism. The doctrine and practice of indulgences in the church are closely linked 
to the effects of the sacrament of penance. You know, penance is working off your sins. An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions, you know, you do enough penance, you give enough money, through the action of the church, the church, not you people, you know, believers, but, you know, the hierarchy of the clergy, that's the church they're talking about, the action of the church, which as the minister of redemption dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfactions of Christ and the saints. In other words, they believe that the guilt of sins has been taken away for Catholics. But the punishment for sins, you need to deal with the church there. You, the church has to be an intermediary there or you're still going to get punished for your sins. So you may need an indulgence. You may need to do some Hail Marys and some Our Fathers and, and some confessions and things like that um, because you're, otherwise you're, you're not covered. Notice, again, the, the hierarchy of the clergy is is the church, and, and they're the medium, the, the, the middleman that gets between you and Christ. We believe as Protestants, because we protested against this 500 years ago, that there's a priesthood of believers, that everyone who believes is a priest before God. You're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, Peter writes in, in his second letter. Guilt still remains, and only the church can take it away. And, and, and the catechism continues, and indulgence is a partial or plenary, depending on what you buy. According to, as it removes either part or all of the temporal punishment due to sin, the faithful can gain indulgences for themselves or apply them to the dead. This is the current Catholic catechism. This isn't 500 years ago. 500 years ago, when John Tetzel was selling indulgences, he really only had permission from the church to sell them for the living and their past sins. He added in future sins, and he added in for the dead, because they were selling so well, and they had to fund St. Peter's, <laughs> which they were building at the time, but, but uh, uh, even Tetzel didn't have as much power as they're giving now to indulgences. And they do their religious stuff, and then, and then they kind of stay away from the church, because if we stay away from the church, then, then we're not aware of our sins, and if we're not aware of them, they don't exist. Right? And if we're not caught, we're not guilty. But if we go to church, we're going to feel guilty. And then we've got to do the, 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 the confessions and the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers and the Beads and, and, and all those things. We've got to work our way back in and, and maybe even buy an indulgence. They've lost the fact, the sight of the fact that Christ alone has fully attained the salvation and, and atonement for our sins. Because he was fully human, because he was fully God, his death on the cross covered all sins for all people who will believe in them. Covered them completely. Nothing else is necessary. You don't have to do any work. There is no work you could possibly do to be worthy of the death of Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews says this. Unlike those other high priests, he, Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. Once for all. One sacrifice for all sins. One sacrifice for all people. One sacrifice for all time. Jesus doesn't have to offer that sacrifice ever again. The church doesn't have to dispense it. It is free. It is available to everyone who will come to Jesus, who will walk with him. It's there. You know, we can look at the, Protestant, the Catholics, though, and, and, and think, oh, well, that's awful. But Protestants do it, too. How often have we seen people who, oh, I've walked the aisle, I said the sinner's prayer, and I get baptized. Now I've got my religious inoculation, I can do as I please, and I've got my ticket to heaven. And so they, they never walk with Christ, they never learn to grow in Christ, they never learn to really be discipled. They sort of just covered the religious stuff, just like the Catholics have done. And then they disappear, we've never seen them again. They don't hunger and thirst after righteousness. They don't hunger for the Spirit of God to fill them, to walk with them. They don't hunger for, for God's presence in their lives. They, see, they've missed the point. The point wasn't to make you religious. It's not about religion. 
It's not about rituals. It's not about, uh, about where you happen to go on Sundays. It's about Jesus Christ and Him only. It's about having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, a right relationship, and then learning to walk with Him as our friend, as our guide, as our leader, as our shepherd, as, as the one who loves us like, like a groom loves a bride, as the one who is preparing a place for us for eternity, the one who so desires our company that He laid down His life on a cross to purchase our salvation, our redemption from sin, that we might spend eternity with Him and Him alone. Paul is so concerned about making this clear that he writes to the Corinthian church. He says, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If you don't pick up anything else that Paul says, if you don't pick up anything else that I say, pick up this, Jesus loves you, this I know. For the Bible tells us so. And His Spirit confirms us confirms it in us that it's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. He also says, rather than using clever and pers persuasive speeches, I relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so that you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. And we learned to trust in God and we learned to walk with Him. Barbara was a delightful lady in my first church. Um, actually, she wasn't in my first church for most of my ministry there. She was a friend of a lady who was in our church. And, and Barbara went to church. She was a community leader. She went to church on occasion because that's what nice people do. And she was a nice lady. And her friend invited her to our church. And, and, and she began to come among us because she discovered that there was something more that she had been missing. There was a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so... We saw Barbara Blossom, and, and uh, it, it hadn't been long that, that she'd been coming to our church, and, and I was called to another church, and I knew I was leaving soon. I was concerned about Barbara. Would she continue to come to church? Would she continue to grow in her, in her faith in Christ? And so one day I, I asked her, and I talked to her, I encouraged her to keep going to church, to keep growing in Christ, and she said, you know, before, I'll never forget what she said. She said, before... When I went to church, that was, that was just church. But this is real. I could never leave this. She's talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Knowing Jesus Christ personally is real. And once he's gotten hold of you, you could never leave him. Let me ask you this morning, have you experienced the real thing? Not religion, not Church organization, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our friend. Have you experienced the real thing by coming to know Him? That's, that's what it's all about. That's what God wants and has wanted for a long time. Jeremiah 9, 23. <clears throat> Jeremiah the prophet says, This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful in their power, or the riches in their riches, or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me, and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. <coughs> what do you want to boast about? What, what, what is really important? To know him. To know him. Jesus fulfilled the, the, the ability for us to know him. The, the prophet said that someday they'll all know him. Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my instructions deep within them, the Lord says. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone, from the least to the greatest, will know me already, says the Lord, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. How do we know God? We know God because He came in the flesh. We know Him in the person of Jesus Christ. We know Him because when Jesus returned to the Father, He sent His Holy Spirit that we might know Him because God dwells in us. God lives in us. We have a relationship with Him. 
Jesus himself, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, pointed out the, 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 the centrality of knowing God. He prayed, and this is the way to eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Listen to the heart of Jesus as, as he invites you to know him. Revelation 3.20, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Friendship with God, a relationship with God, that's, that's what it's all about. John 15.15, 15, on, the, on the night uh, when Jesus was betrayed, he said to his disciples, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now, you are my friends, since I've told you everything the Father told me. It's not about religion. It's not about how much you can attempt to be good and earn your way into heaven. It's not about the fact that you do all the right things. You know, you can do all the right things and have all the right religion and not have Christ and end up with just empty form. If you have Christ, and even if you don't have the religion and the forms, you have eternal life and you have everything in Him. Everything else will come along with that relationship. After all, what did Jesus say to those people who thought they had Jesus because they had religion? They did all the right things, but they didn't know Him. It's just apart from me. In Matthew 7, 22 to 23, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. On that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we buy indulgences? <laughs> didn't we get our tickets? Well, here, depart from me. I never knew you. Lord, didn't I walk the aisle? Didn't I do the sinner's prayer? Didn't I just do all the right stuff? Didn't I do the forms, the magic formula? Depart from me. I never knew you. If we don't enter into a relationship with Christ, we have nothing. But when we have him, we have everything. Sola, solus Christus. Christ alone. Relationship with Him is what He calls you to. A relationship that lasts forever. Because He's taken away your sins. He's taken away everything that would have separated you from God. And now He invites you into His family. As His sons and daughters, precious and dearly loved. He knows you. He loves you. Are you walking with Him this morning? Do you know that you've been saved by Christ alone and that it is in Him that our hope is found. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, so often we get caught up in stuff and what we do and what we say and being right and thinking that we can blow it. But, Lord, you've done everything for us. It's all been done. You, you you already accomplished everything on the cross. So, Lord, help us day by day to simply walk with you. To learn your ways, to delight in your ways, for your ways are good and true and holy and right. We know that you are the one path. We often stray on the other paths, but you told us that You've begun a good work in us and you'll complete it. You'll keep us on the path. You're going to get us safely home and we rejoice in that. For we often fail. But you never do. We thank you. We pray, Father, that, that you'll keep us walking with you. We pray for those that we know that need to know you. That, that the way we walk with you will draw them to you. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, I just pray that you touch them by your Holy Spirit. Let them know that they are loved. And know that you want them with you for eternity. And that you are the way to get there. 
We pray these things in Jesus' precious name.